known Dr. Davidson for most, if not all, of my scientific career, so it's a real pleasure to host him here. I first met Dr. Davidson when we were both graduate students um, at the Society for uh, Research on Biological Rhythms meeting in 1998. I don't want to date you too much, Dr. Davidson, but we were both uh, second year graduate students. He was at Florida State University and I was at Georgia State University and we became friends after that and we stayed in touch throughout our graduate uh, matriculation. He did uh, 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 groundbreaking work in during graduate school that uh, Florida State University, looking at uh, food anticipatory rhythms and the uh, and the food and tradable circadian oscillator, um, very impressive work. Um, after which time, and that was under the direction of Dr. Fred Stefan, um, somewhat of a legend in our field of circadian rhythms, uh, you know, uh, and uh, and the work that he did with Dr. Stefan um, was again groundbreaking, innovative work that really taught us a lot about the food and trainable oscillator and and, and anticipatory um, activity. From there, he went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the uh, Center for Biological Timing at the University of Virginia, who was uh, that center was directed at the time by Dr. Gene Block, who was our current chancellor and who was, who was present. Uh, Dr. Davidson went on to work with uh, Dr. Block and Dr. Michael Meneker to conduct a pioneering work in circadian rhythms and aging. And, um, and during that time, they published uh, several papers um, uh, uh, looking, at, looking at rhythms and, and, and a variety of tissues. And one pioneering, or well, several pioneering papers, I don't want to suggest they did one, but one paper that stands out to me was the chronic, a paper entitled Chronic Jet Lag Increases Mortality in Aged Mice. That paper um, was a very uh, uh, influential and pivotal paper in our field. It showed that chronic phase advances in aged mice could, um, could increase mortality and produce uh, a variety of morbidities. And that, um, that work is still um, serves as a, 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 a platform for much of our work in, in rhythms today. It, it, it kind of took our field in, in directions that we hadn't anticipated. After that, uh, Dr. Dave, I was a, I was a, a postdoc at the time at, at Northwestern University, and Dr. Davidson and I were recruited at the exact same time to a burgeoning neurobiology program in Morehouse School of Medicine. We were both recruited as assistant faculty members um, in which I stayed for 10 years. Dr. Davidson is still there and we had been there. I, again, I, Dr. Davidson, I'd known um, you know, since, since uh, years before our recruitment and that was just a great time at, at Morehouse School of Medicine as that program grew. They now still have um, one of the leading um, circadian rhythms and sleep groups in the country of which Dr. Davidson is co-director of right now. So on top of all of the pioneering scientific work he's done in our field, he is now leading a group of, of circadian and sleep researchers at Morehouse School of Medicine, which is a historically black college and university. Um, uh, so it's a it's a it's a quite a, an accomplishment and a feat. Um, to date, we are have the uh, pleasure of hosting Dr. Davidson. He's going to give a talk. Let me get rid of this for you. Dr. Davison, entitled Visualization of Cellular and, and Network Rhythmicity in the Suprachiasmatic Nucleus in Vivo. And with that, I will present to you Dr. Alec Davidson. All right, I got this. Thing. Right. Thank you. Oh, great. This is awesome. Um, and uh, God, I wish I had brought pictures of Katema back then. Um, he was quite the ladies' man. He had these long dreadlocks. Uh, yeah, just uh, exactly the personality you know now, but much younger. <laughs> and uh, we had a good time together, got to know each other quite well. And it was definitely one of the reasons I, I was excited to come to, to MSM, because I knew that Katema was also coming at the same time. And uh, and to be honest, a, another really important part of the of, of, of us going there and the and the creation and the growth of the circadian and sleep group at Morehouse School of Medicine, which is a rarely large um, group at an institution that doesn't have a huge NIH footprint, was because of the, the early work with Dr. Block having, um, you know, being part of the external advisory committee in the early um, days of, of the Specialized Neuroscience Research Program, which was an, an effort put together by NANDS to create neuroscience training opportunities at an HBCU, which hadn't happened ever before. And uh, I think Jean was involved in the selection and hiring of, of, of our mentor, one of our two mentors when we were there, uh, Peter McLeish, who was just a game changer in my career and Katima's career as well. Um, 
Uh, and so there's this genesis of, or, or nexus of, of, of all of us kind of coming together. And the, the last piece of that is Gianluca Tosini, who also trained at University of Virginia with Mike Maneker and Gene Block, but years before. Or I did. And he is still my mentor at MSM. And you still call him and ask him advice constantly. Um, his door is, he's two doors down from me. I'm very energetic, Florentine uh, um, uh, uh, animated uh, uh, guy who's, uh, who's uh, again, just a, a critical part um, of the success of, I think, of all of us. So anyway, this is a great in invitation. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I had a great time. Chris took me around LA yesterday and, and, and had the, the grace to put me up uh, at his house and met his wife and, and have had a great time. So um, this is really cool. Appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I guess since it's such a small group, I don't mind if you inter interrupt me and ask me questions. If you have questions, especially the students, if there's something you don't get, like I said earlier to some of you, I'd rather you interrupt me and understand it than, uh, than to be shy and think that you're going to be you know, embarrassed by asking a question. Please do that because um, you, you stand to get the most out of these things. Gene knows most of this data. Katame is not you. So, um, so, all right. So, and I know some of you have a background in circadian rhythms. This might be a little bit basic. I'll probably try to go through it a little bit quickly. The very, you know, basic, basic stuff about sleep and circadian biology. Um, but I want to start by saying that, that circadian rhythms are 24-hour variations in biology, in function, in behavior, in physiology, and they're driven by internal clocks. These clocks evolved in response to the fact that we have a cyclic environment. Because of the rotation of the earth, light is appearing and disappearing at reliable times each day, and animals and nature and humans as a result have developed biological strategies through, ev through evolution to maximize, maximize their interaction in this temporally changing environment, such that they can kind of prepare and, prepare and, and expect changes versus react to them. Um, so it's basically a proactive uh, way to regulate our behavior and physiology to be maximally successful uh, in competing for resources and avoiding predation in nature. Um, in our modern world, these rhythms sometimes are not so adaptive. Uh, we have, um, I'm wondering how to do pointer, I guess I can use this. Uh, we have dramatically changed our lighting environment. And if you didn't already know this, circadian rhythms require and use light to reset every day. And so these are uh, satellite photographs of the earth. Um, this one is predicted, of course, this is 2025. I've been using this slide for a while and now it's almost 2025. So it, well, maybe we'll have to val validate uh, that slide, but um, this is uh, Atlanta. Is, is right here. Uh, I guess LA is uh, that one. All right. Um, we have re really dramatically changed our, our environment um, from times at which rhythms evolved. Uh, and that allows us to do things like stay up late at night being at work or studying for exams and doing all sorts of other things like shift work uh, that wasn't possible before we had uh, electric light. Um, artificial light. And it turns out, and one of the reasons why um, we think circadian rhythms are important to study and is because people who mess with their rhythms through doing shift work um, have um, all kinds of health risks. Uh, they die at higher rates of breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer. They get more ulcers, more diabetes and metabolic syndrome, um, heart disease and heart attacks, uh, strokes, uh, autoimmune disease, like the two listed here, MS and, and IBS. Um, and uh, the, the data are really so compelling, um, especially in the breast cancer literature, that the World Health Organization, back in 2006, 2006, I can't remember now, and but reiterated it, you know, more recently have uh, determined that shift work is a carcinogen, a class 2A probable human carcinogen. And if you look at, you know, World Health Organization's IAARC's list of carcinogens available online, they're all chemicals. There's hundreds and hundreds of chemicals. And then there's UV light and there's circadian disruption <laughs> as, as occurs in shift workers. So this is a lifestyle that people do because of necessity. Uh, it's 20% of the US working population and they get higher rates of all these diseases. And uh, one some of the work that I've done over the years that actually Katema just mentioned, uh, Dr. Paul uh, just mentioned the, uh, the genesis of when I was working in Dr. Block's lab at UVA. Um, we've been trying to use animal models to see if we can understand these things and, and create uh, strategies for mitigating such consequences. Um, and if, you, if you're not in rhythms and you weren't aware, um, the field, and we call it, we kind of 
take this on as, as a, you know, a feather in all our cap. The field was given this, the, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2017. Uh, and these are uh, three people who, who worked on the molecular clock in flies um, years ago. And Mike Rosbash right here, he just visited MSM a couple of, of months ago and gave a fantastic talk. Uh, and so these guys have become real ambassadors to the field and taking their kind of pseudo fame and, and, and helping to, to spread it around and tell our presidents that are in institutions how important we are. Of course, Dr. Block already knows this about this group, but um, sometimes my president needs to be reminded how important our research is. So, <laughs> so that was appreciated. Um, okay. Now uh, on to you know, what I'm going to actually talk about today. It's the second half of this slide, but I wanted to hit on this and actually I'd already hinted at it. And so did, so did Dr. Paul. Um, one of the focuses in my lab historically has been the, the health consequences of environmental circadian disruption. Uh, the paper that he mentioned where we studied um, uh, death uh, in aged mice exposed to chronically advancing light cycles, kind of similar to rotating and shift work. Um, that was kind of the genesis of this of, of this work. And when I moved to Morehouse from, from Gene's lab at UVA and, and set up my own lab, we, we spent years really working on animal models of shift work and studying um, alterations uh, in innate immune function. Um, more recently, we've looked at stroke and kidney disease in, in these animal models, just changing the life cycles, changes their resilience, changes their ability to cope uh, with just about any uh, health challenge um, that you present them with. Uh, the other half of the lab, and what I'm really funded to do now, and what I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail uh, in this talk, is our work on the on the circuitry of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, the SCN is a structure in the ventral hypothalamus that gets direct light information from the eyes, and it it, it is it serves as the master oscillator of of the of of the. Um, so you guys will be able to see this, but online they won't, I guess. Is that should just use this one? Why is that? Is it hard to see the the pointer? No, I'm just okay. Maybe I wasn't using it. I don't know. Um, whatever you want me to do. Just all right. Okay. Cool. Okay, um, so suprachiasmatic nucleus, it seems to be the center, you know, we, we think of it as the orchestra conductor. That's the metaphor that seems most apt uh, because there are clocks all throughout the brain and body, but the master oscillator in the SCN seems to be the one that keeps pace and keeps them all in line. It gets direct light information about the environment, which allows it to reset and, and make it a more precise clock. And then it communicates this timing information to the clocks throughout the brain and the body uh, that regulate actual output functions. Um, the SCN is uh, clearly important when you, it's its uh, right here where these arrows are. Um, and, and this is the optic chiasm. Um, this is a actogram of activity in a nocturnal rat. Um, it's showing that when, the, when it's uh, dark in the environment, which is where the, when this bar occurs, these are just days, actually two days uh, plotted across each bar and each of these little blips is, a, is activity um, recorded by running wheel. Uh, so this animal is active when it's dark in the chamber. Uh, and um, the SCN is intact. And when you lesion the SCN, this is again a coronal slice. There's no more SCN here. Uh, you get arrhythmicity. Uh, and so there's been 50 years now of convergent evidence of the importance of this clock. Um, lesions cause uh, loss of arrhythmicity. I just showed you that. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Friedrich K. Stefan, who uh, Dr. Paul did mention, and we just lost about a month and a half ago. He just passed. Uh, but he was my major professor. And back in 72 at UC Berkeley, he was one of the guys credited with the discovery that this uh, clock is important or critical for uh, circadian behavior. Um, uh, further evidence over these past 50 years since it's been discovered, 51 years now, uh, the SCN itself has rhythmic properties. You know, it, it utilizes glucose rhythmically. It does other things. It has electrophysiological rhythms when measured um, in the animal. Um, when you isolate the SCN, uh, rhythms remain inside this area, but are no longer able to be transmitted outward, outside, and the rhythms in, outside of the SCN in the brain and in behavior go away, even when the SCN is still there, but disconnected from the rest of the brain. Um, if you take the SCN out and put it in a dish, it has sustained rhythms. It carries on those rhythms as long as this structure can be alive. And one of our former colleagues at UVA, who's now at UT Southwestern, kept one of these SCN cultures alive in a dish for two plus years long after the animal could have survived and kept it alive. And it continued to show circadian oscillations and molecular activity, which is pretty incredible. He actually tried to send that to the uh, uh, the book of world records the, and, and they, they ignored him completely. Guinness book of world records. 
Um, and even single cells uh, in, in the SCN uh, can act as clocks. They're a little bit sloppier when, when isolated, but uh, so there's all this evidence. Um, plus when you transplant uh, the SCN, from one animal to another, and these clocks run at different speeds because of genetic mutations. Not only does it restore a rhythm in a lesioned animal by transplanting a fetal SCN, but it actually, the speed of the genetic speed of that clock drives the, the host. So there's all this evidence that the SCN is super, super important, uh, and uh, which uh, um, kind of leads us to uh, look at it um, now and, and study it uh, using all the tools at our, at our uh, disposal. Um, so here it is actually in sagittal slice. This is where it's located, again, in the base of the brain. In coronal um, slice, you have uh, basically two major kind of uh, uh, physical or, or structural, um, structurally obvious uh, uh, portions to or, or parts of the nucleus, the core and the shell. And what makes them um, a little bit unique is their pattern of expression of certain neuropeptides. Now the whole nucleus is GABAergic and it's packed tightly with cells, small, small neurons, and it's also full of astrocytes. Um, but you know, if, if you stain for certain neuropeptides, you can see these functional divisions or, or anatomical divisions that we're still kind of for, working on function of. Um, and so it, what's stained here in green uh, is, is uh, VIP. Uh, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. It seems to mark these cells in the core of the nucleus that get direct photic innervation from the retina through the hypo, through the uh, hypothalamic uh, retinohypothalamic tract coming off of the optic chiasm down below. Uh, and then you have the shell that is enriched in vasopressin. Um, which is antidiuretic hormone, but it's also a marker for this these cells in, in the shell of this nucleus. Let's see, oops. Hitting the wrong things. Okay. Um, and here's another drawing kind of showing these different components in the sagittal plane. You have um, a GABA, these blue dots kind of scattered throughout, uh, vasoactive intestinal, poly intestinal polypeptide, VIP, as well as uh, gastrin releasing peptide found in this core region, and then vasopressin in the shell. And each of these groups of cells form subnetworks. They're all communicating one another. They're all coupled with one another uh, through various forms of signaling, um, the details of which we haven't actually fully, uh, fully worked out. And this is just another histological image, this time from my lab. So I've been focused recently in, on vasopressin. And part of the reason is uh, it's not as well studied. Um, uh, Dr. Caldwell has been interested in, in VIP and he's studied that for years as many other people have. They're enigmatic cells. They respond acutely to light input. But the AVP cells haven't been as, as widely studied. And most of what we know was uh, really done in, in, in Kanazawa um, University by Dr. Mieda. And um, some of his kind of important work um, shows that knocking out the clock in AVP neurons significantly disrupts circadian rhythms, behavioral rhythms. Um, which along with other evidence suggests that they are important for organizing SCN output signals that synchronize bodily rhythms. Um, and, uh, and also changing the clocks in these cells um, does seem to drive the speed of, of, of output rhythms. Um, and so it, this output is probably the result of interaction among these AVP neurons at the network level. Uh, and uh, however, if you just uh, lose AVP itself, it doesn't really have much of a consequence. So AVP may be just a marker for a group of cells or a group of subtypes of cells. Um, AVP itself doesn't seem to be critically important. Um, so, and that brings us to, to kind of where I started to become interested or, or I should say what the, the work we're gonna do today is, is kind of builds off of that and, and but utilizes kind of new approaches, um, approaches that, um, that nobody really thought would work and we've gotten, gotten lucky and made, made, um, made work. Uh, and that is to use uh, in vivo recording to record what individual cells of certain uh, of specific subtypes are doing um, over longitudinal time in this nucleus to try to figure out you know, how, how these cells express rhythms. Do they all do it? Do they all do it at the same time? Uh, and how does the single cell versus the network um, account for certain behavioral features of circadian rhythms? We're still in the early days of this. We've just you know published one paper, but it's exciting and it's the new technique for the field. And so we're trying to share it as much as we can. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of the, the, the miniscope people are here in the room, maybe students. Um, this is the, the miniscope control. Uh, I actually actually here about five years ago to learn how to make these miniaturized fluorescence microscopes. Um, 
to record calcium activity in awake behaving animals. And uh, luckily uh, for us, we were able to get a grant to, to buy the commercial versions, which cost about 20 times as much, but uh, come with nice support. And, uh, and so we, we've been using Enscopix um, uh, miniaturized fluorescent microtopes to, to do this work. But, uh, but I appreciated everything I learned when I came out here. So basically how this works is you have um, neurons in the SCN, um, in this case, in our case in the SCN, this is a very generic drawing actually, it just happens to be this is roughly in the base of the brain, about the same place. Um, so this is a Nature Protocols paper in 2016 um, that isn't specific to the way we do it, but it, it's illustrative. Uh, so you have, you have these neurons that have been infected with a virus uh, that express uh, GCAMP6, which is a uh, molecule um, that is uh, that is fluorescent, and it's based on green fluorescent protein, but fluoresces in proportion to how much calcium is present in the immediate environment. Uh, so it's a reporter for calcium levels in, in, in neurons. And if you are a neuroscientist, you know that calcium is a really important signaling molecule, um, and concentration of calcium goes up in activated neurons, and is actually, it's functionally important for the release of, of neurotransmitter. Um, so working upward, here's our fluorescing cells, and, um, and here's a microendoscope or a, or a relay lens implanted all the way down into the brain and terminating the bottom of the lens sits right over the SCN in our case, or whatever your target cells might be. Um, and then uh, this microscope is mounted to the head through, through a, a, a mounting system, a base plate. Uh, and it's a fully functioning um, imaging fluorescence microscope with a fluorescence light source and uh, all the all the um, uh, the the filters uh, and dichroic that you need um, and a sensor at the top and it's directly connected to a computer, um, which then gives you an image every microsecond or however fast you want to run it that allows you to draw circles in the in the field of view, identifying where individual neurons are. We call these regions of interest, and then and then basically you can plot the the amount of fluorescence within each ROI over time. Uh, and you can do things to the animal's environment and then watch how the neurons change. So here's, here's two potential neurons recorded for 30, or no, this is 30 seconds here. So it's maybe a, a 10 minute long recording. Uh, and a stimulus is provided here. And this neuron decides to become active. This neuron was active and becomes inhibited or stops behaving. And these are the types of, of things you can do with this technique. Okay. Um, and since in our prep, these animals are awake, behaving, walking around their cage, um, we, the, the eyes are still hooked up to the SCN, we can provide, for example, a light stimulus and uh, see acute changes in specific cell populations, longitudinal changes in those cell populations we record over days, um, and, and are able to appreciate the fact that cells may do different things from one another. And, uh, and, and individual cells and network behavior uh, can be actually teased apart in ways that other methods don't really provide the mechanism, the means to do. EFIS in vivo, it's very difficult to get single cells, to identify single cells, especially large numbers of them. Um, it's a population measure and it's hard to target specific cell types. And same thing with fibrophotometry. It's really a population measure. You don't get single cells, even though you can target specific cell types. So it's got some advantages. It's also uh, quite challenging to do because the SCN is very deep in the brain and it's very small. And being able to get not only your virus expressed there, but also your lens in the right place to be successful, uh, it was not an easy thing to overcome. Uh, so we built some, you know, once we established uh, the approach, built these uh, recording cabinets. Um, they have the ability to record locomotor activity and body temperature uh, through this uh, uh, mini emitter receiver. So they are, they, the animals have a, have a, a transmitter um, that gives us locomotor activity and body temperature rhythms. Um, there's a mouse in here. Um, here's the, the wire going up to a commutator. Um, we can see the animal, even when the enclosure, it's a light tight enclosure completely. It's got its own airflow. Um, we have, uh, you know, infrared cameras. So we can see the animal's activity, make sure they're okay. So we don't have to disturb them during experiments. Um, and uh, so you put this giant lens in the head uh, and um, animal seems kind of able to do most things that a mouse can do. I mean, have you challenged them? I suppose in, in more advanced ways, you might find there's some deficits, but you're only affecting one side of the brain. The SCN itself, the lens isn't actually penetrating if we're doing it right. Um, and this mouse can still rear, even though they're wearing this thing on their head that weighs you know, a couple of grams. Um, let's see, it. I'll play it again. Uh, they can explore, they can eat and drink, and they can live for months or longer. And you know, to be to be 
if you look back at the history of circadian rhythms, I mean, um, multi-unit electrode or, or have been dropped into the SCN, lesion devices, of course, um, uh, 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 um, microdialysis probes, which are pretty large. So this isn't all that different fundamentally. Um, but just because we have to, we, we kind of showed that um, uh, animals with these implants have normally entrained circadian rhythms um, and they can phase shift in response to an advance of the light cycle like we expect them to be able to do. So uh, rhythms seem more or less intact. It's an important thing to know if we're going to study the. We don't want our method of measuring the behavior to be interfering with the, with the behavior itself. Um, this is an example of histology from one of our preps. This is now G-CAMP-6 fluorescence. Here's the optic chiasm. Here's the third ventricle. Here's a big hole where the lens was. This is after a recording was finished, obviously. Uh, and it's sitting right over the SCN. And, and in some of our preps, the lens is more like here. Um, this is actually quite far away, but it's, it's typical for these preps for um, your subject to be at least a few hundred microns away from the bottom of the lens. Uh, and and this, this is an AVP IRES2 Cree mice. So it's, we have Cree expressed in uh, AVP neurons specifically. And then um, a, a, a flexed, uh, uh, which is similar to Flox, um, uh, uh, genelia Farms version of GCAMP7S um, with a synapsin promoter to, to help it express in, in neurons. Uh, and in this case, and this isn't going to be true for the very last thing I show you, but for all the data I'm about to show you, these were viral injections uh, where we first drill a hole, knock the animal out, put them in the stereotexas device, um, drill a hole, drop the needle in, inject the virus, and then immediately go in with a lens. Uh, and everything's blind, basically. And the SCN, as I mentioned, is deep, it's small, and it's far from our reference points on the surface of the skull. So your likelihood of missing is very, very high, uh, as we became aware. Um, and, uh, um, and in this case, we didn't know until about six weeks later if we we're going to get anything out of that mouse because it takes that long for the virus to express enough. And then we can look through, look through the lens with a camera and see if we see anything. And uh, oftentimes we did not see anything, but we did uh, see uh, enough times that, that our first papers come out. Um, Colocalization, just an example um, of AVP and, and, and GCAMP uh, expressing in some of the same neurons. Um, and we didn't really expect that all of the, uh, uh, all of the GCAMP7 expressing cells would also express AVP, partly because just a quirk of this, of this particular mouse is that uh, they're a bit, little bit hypomorphic for AVP expression, especially in the homozygous AVP Cree, there's almost no AVP to be measured. For some reason, the presence of the Cree recombinase um, is affecting expression of the peptide. So getting co good co-localization, even with colchicine and, and ways to enhance it wasn't um, uh, guaranteed, uh, but we did see some uh, examples of co-localization. We never saw uh, GCAMP7 being expressed in, for example, VIP neurons, which is another interesting population that I've mentioned a few times already, uh, but were not the target of our study. So this is sped up about uh, 20 times or so. Um, what you're seeing is a field of view of neurons. And if you've ever looked at calcium imaging data from hippocampus or cortex, you're going to see like 100 cells and it's going to look amazing. And we get maybe 15 cells when we have a good animal. Uh, and this is a much smaller lens that is typically used. A diameter of the lens is only half a millimeter. Um, they often use two millimeter wide lenses, often 1.8, uh, much bigger. They get a much bigger field of view. Uh, so we're happy when we get a couple of neurons. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just play it one more time. It's fun seeing cells do things. And this is, again, an animal walking around his cage, experiencing things, eating, drinking, seeing light. Um, it's actually kind of amazing that it works. So the next step would be to draw reasons of interest around these signals uh, and then um, create what's equivalent to EFIS data, so line data um, of, you know, the, the five minute recordings that we would do. Uh, and um, something we saw right away in these neurons was this kind of slow high amplitude oscillation in signal um, that, that we initially interpreted as burst firing. You know, this is this is a proxy for the activity state in the neuron. And when the calcium's high, the neuron is firing. Um, that's how these data are usually interpreted from, G, from GCAMP. 
Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm not going to really go into the data, um, but our paper, our paper actually followed up with uh, with cell type targeted EFIS and showed that they are indeed burst firing. And that is a characteristic of vasopressin neurons that has been reported before in other areas like the supra optic nucleus. And apparently they do it in the SCN. And when we looked enough, we actually saw um, hints in the literature of other people having seen something similar uh, in, in, in certain cells near electrodes in micro, you know, in, in, in multi-unit recordings published 20 years ago. So kind of verified that these are bursty cells and this is just a characteristic of them. Uh, five minute recordings, um, eight a day. So every three hours, uh, and we would do it over 48 hours. And that's the general strategy. And this is different than the way calcium imaging is usually done. Normally people put them in a car, in a, in a, in a maze and they'll look for hippocampal cells that are fire when the animal's in this location versus this location. This is very different. We're looking longitudinally and we're not even looking at single spikes. This is the, a slow version of GCAMP that is uh, gonna tell you general activation state of the cell but won't resolve individual spikes. But we care more about the longitudinal kind of long-term hours-based changes than we do about the millisecond changes. Okay, uh, since this hadn't been done before, we kind of had to get together uh, and figure out what are we gonna quantify in these signals? And there was a lot of choices and we kind of did it every, every way we could think of. So some of the measures that we ended up using that's, that's in our paper are, I mean, what's just the average intensity across this three minute or five minute recording? And then plotting that at different circadian times. Is, is that kind of basal activation state reflected just the mean intensity of the fluorescent signal um, over time? Um, and I should just, just give um, credit to Adam Stowe, who was the postdoc who trusted me way too much and took on this project. And uh, he's no longer in science. I hope it's not because I killed him, killed his scientific. No, he, he, I mean, he, he would have had a nice PNAS paper and had gotten a nice job had he uh, stuck with it. But instead, he had a baby and took another job that paid quite well. So I don't I don't blame him at all. Um, Morris Benvenisti is the guy who really helped us do all in the analysis. Again, having to develop tools that hadn't been you know, there was no there was no tools available for analysis of these types of data. So he uh, he he you know caved into all of my whims about you know, various ways to analyze the data and created tools in Igor because he was an EFIS guy who wrote all his own software for analysis and he's kind of tackled this as a non-circadian person. We've dragged him in. Um, anyway, so mean intensity was one potential measure that maybe that expresses a rhythm across time. Um, maybe maybe not. Uh, we also had, um, we just established an algorithm to determine acute changes in the signal. Uh, and so we just called that acute events. This was a completely unbiased measure. And we also just counted these, what we called calcium waves, which I ended up telling you, or, or, or you seem to be burst firing to see if that behavior, is that changing amplitude or changing, um, uh, uh, you know, the inner, inner event interval, um, the number of these events that occur in a five minute period, is that changing across circadian time? Uh, these are the types of things we, we, uh, yeah, I already mentioned, or we've, we verified that that's bursting. We did the experiment across 48 hours in both DD and in LD. Okay. Mean intensity. Okay, so what you're seeing here now is a heat plot um, where each row is one area, one region of interest. And across all of these rows are all the neurons we recorded across all the mice. So we've kind of compiled the data here. Uh, and uh, this is the intensity measured in, 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 in the heat map where um, and brightest is, is yellow. Uh, and if it's if if the cell exists above this dotted line in this arrow, that means it was determined to be rhythmic according to our our uh, chi square our, our cosine analysis. We we measured rhythms and we quantified rhythms in a lot of different ways. Ended up cosine was the kind of easiest and found the most rhythms actually um, was the least stringent, which was important because we were not seeing rhythms in all the cells. We kind of expected to, but there a very small proportion, maybe less than twenty five percent, are showing a rhythm in in mean intensity. That was a surprise to us. Surprise to our reviewers too. <laughs> uh, and that differed slightly in DD and LD, but the general concept is they're, they're not all the cells are rhythmic. And if you just add them all together, like a fiber photometry signal and or average them all, you get no rhythm in DD and there is a eh, reasonably good rhythm in LD. Um, but uh, that's just probably because it's a higher proportion of rhythmic in this, in this, in this state. Um, but the diversity didn't stop there. Um, we saw of the rhythmic neurons, diversity in phase. Okay, and as you plot, when is the peak brightness for all these cells across the 48 hour day? 
turned into circadian time, they were kind of distributed, some during the day, some during the night. Um, in, in DD, um, the subjective day and subjective night. In LD, they were a little bit better clustered, which probably accounts for why there's a population rhythm. Uh, and this is, again, the proportion rhythmic, only 50% here, about 25% here. Uh, but what we saw, if you looked at like the first day, remember, these are 48 hour recordings. So this is 24 hours and then that's 24 hours, right? Um, if you look at the cells that were rhythmic in the first 24 hours and then whether they were still rhythmic in the second 24 and vice versa, the ones that were maybe non-rhythmic in the first 24 and rhythmic in the second 24, that population was actually changing just during a 48 hour recording. There seems to be some stochasticity to whether these cells expressed a rhythm or not in mean intensity. Uh, so that's what's being shown here in this, what we call a phenotype tracking map. Um, and so if, if a cell is rhythmic, it's above this arrow in the first 24 hours. And if a cell is rhythmic in the second 24 hours, it's above this arrow. And then we just say, is that cell stay rhythmic? Does it become arrhythmic? Or if it was arrhythmic, does it become rhythmic or does it stay arrhythmic, right? So just kind of tracking across the two days, was it rhythmic and did it stay so? Uh, and we saw this stochasticity. It was a little bit um, more consistent in, in, in when you compare DD to LD, are the same cells in DD rhythmic in LD? Where in this case, since we had this increased number, it kind of made sense that there were more cells that were becoming rhythmic. But it's good to understand these figures because I'm gonna show you according to the other circadian measures that we used, or the other fluorescence measures we used, we plotted it the same way. So if you have a question about how to read these, or maybe you just trust me in my interpretations, that's fine too. But ask me if you want, because this is, a, this is gonna show up a few more times. Okay, the unbiased acute events was another way we counted what was happening or kind of quantified what was happening in these cells. Um, the heat map is not the best way probably to see these rhythms, even though these, these because sometimes these the rhythms are pretty low amplitude. Um, and, uh, but the way we, we scaled this, it's actually quite hard to see, but, but, but the cells above this line are rhythmic, um, but there's no, and when you add it all together, average it all together, there doesn't seem to be much of a population rhythm, even though the, the cells that are rhythmic tend, some of them tend to, to scatter or tend to um, uh, peak, or, you know, during kind of early subjective night. But there's also all these other ones that are having different, completely different phases. So uh, they're kind of, uh, there is no population rhythm as a result in these acute events. Again, a surprise in fiber photometry data um, of, from um, VIP cells, uh, you get a nice population rhythm, right? Uh, it, using GCAMP, uh, but at the individual cell level and in AVP neurons, we didn't. Um, in the way this is quantified. In LD is really the same story. Less than 50% expressed a rhythm, and of those rhythms, they're kind of distributed at all different phases, which doesn't provide the opportunity for much of a population rhythm. Uh, and again, we had state switching. We had some cells started arrhythmic and stayed so, but some that started arrhythmic in the first day in DD, you know, became arrhythmic, and then some that started arrhythmic being arrhythmic, a whole bunch stayed arrhythmic. Even more profound kind of state switching when you look at the cells in DD and then the exact same cells in LD across each 48 hours. A bunch are changing. They are stochastic. There aren't a subpopulation that are always rhythmic and then a subpopulation that aren't. They're just always changing. And there's always a proportion there are. And there seems to be sharing of the responsibility to some extent for generating rhythms. Um, but I'd say overall, the take home from this so far is that individual cells don't have all that strong of a rhythm. These ABP neurons don't. Um, calcium waves, this bursting activity, it's really the exact same story that I just told you for the other two. But if you look at kind of a summary of all the single cell parameters, um, you do start seeing uh, some patterns. Um, while in DD, this purple line is, is, means all the measures were arrhythmic, there are quite a few, maybe 40%, but that leaves 60% that had a rhythm in at least one of the measures. And in LD, it's kind of the same story. We had actually a higher proportion. This is a 25% arrhythmic across all of the measures, but there's, uh, the rest did express a rhythm in at least something. Uh, and then um, if a cell was rhythmic in one parameter, was it rhythmic on all of the parameters? That was generally not always true. Um, the typical, the modal kind of number of rhythmic parameters any cell would have um, is, is, uh, is one. number, and, and that was true in both DD and in LD, that if it was rhythmic, it was most likely rhythmic in just one of these parameters and not all of them. 
Uh, and uh, yeah. So most shells are, I'd say the majority of cells show a rhythm in something, but robust single cell rhythms are generally an unstable and stochastic characteristic for AVP neurons. Um, but that leads us to the, really the strength of this technique is not just looking at what single cells do, but what is the population doing and might be doing things in concert with one another that you can really only appreciate when you can see two single cells and then compare their activity to one another. So that's where I'm leading you next. Network analysis, the most basic, simple version of a network analysis. It, it already started revealing interesting things, and I think it'll continue to. Um, and why is this uh, useful to do? Well, again, the SCN is a network of cellular oscillators that show coupling. They talk to each other constantly through gap junctions, through neurotransmitters, through neuromodulators. Um, and so we asked the question of whether there might be a division of labor um, um, across these cells in the network among cells of the same type or among cell types that may occur in this, in this nucleus. You can really only see this by using a method like the one we used. Perhaps does the network account for the complex, complexity and behavioral uh, outputs, behavior and outputs um, in a manner that can't be counted for, by for single cell behavior? And this is something in the field we use uh, a phrase called emergent properties. And, uh, and my, my uh, analysis guru, Morris, that I mentioned, he hates this phrase. I haven't convinced him why it's a, why it's a good phrase. Um, but I think it's, it's one of those terms we use in the field to basically reflect the fact that the population is, wor is more than the sum of the, of the individual parts that there's a collaborative function of some kind. Otherwise, why not just have one cell? Like why have a whole network, right? Um, okay, so uh, like I said, this is the simplest manner of a network analysis you could imagine. Let's take two different cells in the field of view. And here's you know the, the, the readouts from these two cells. And let's just straight correlate them. What is the R squared? What is, what is the Pearson coefficient of these two signals for those three minutes or five minutes. And then we can plot that for, the, for that pair of neurons for every circadian time that we studied. And if you look at this rhythm, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, these cells have a 0.6 Pearson coefficient in the middle of the circadian day, either in LD or in DD. And they're not correlated at all, or it may be even inversely correlated during circadian night. This means that this pattern across the two cells looked quite similar in some important characteristic, um, but only during the day. And they were doing very different things at night. So it's some kind of coordinated, whether they're both getting the same input and, and then, and therefore um, uh, exhibiting the same uh, behavior in the recording, um, or they're actively, um, uh, you know, they're, they're stimulating each other's behavior. Um, there's a number of potential ways that this could arise. Uh, and, you know, in, this the fact that uh, what could be an excitatory coupling becomes an inhibitory coupling across the day and night is is not actually a completely shockingly new idea. There there are some hypotheses about uh, changing functions of GABA across the day and night within the supergeismatic nucleus. Um, but this is where we start to see really robust rhythms finally, which was satisfying. This is something we were looking for. Um, so we have obviously, since there's a certain number of cells, you look at the comparisons of all the pairwise, you know, all the pairwise comparisons, you get far more. And so this is why these heat maps are much, much bigger. But this is now how each pairwise comparison, whether they're rhythmic, both in DD and in LD across the 48 hours, same conventions. If they were, if if a pair is rhythmic, um, it's it, at 48 hours for this condition, it's above this line. Uh, and so that's about 25% in both DD and in LD. But look at the population rate. Them. It's really robust. It peaks during uh, late in the circadian day, which is when you expect it to. If you're an SCN physiologist, if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. It's all pairs. All pairs are reflected here. Well, so in, in any field of view, you have, I don't know, we had some, some recordings, we had five cells, some cords, we had 15 cells. But for every single poss possible pairwise comparison, those are all reflected up there in that heat map. We didn't choose any. All pairs are included. I'm not sure I understand that question. How do you decide that one cell, cell one, cell? All comparisons are already up there. And so they're sorting themselves. 
every single possible pairwise, we did the correlation across circadian time. And that's what's reflected in these heat maps. That's what there's first 400 comparisons because every we couldn't obviously compare a pair from one animal to another animal. It had to be within the same animal, but all possible pairwise within each recording are reflected in the analysis. So there was no selection. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Morris wrote the software and did the analysis for us. <laughs> he didn't have to do this by hand. We just had to think it up and then wait for Morris to write the software. Well, I think we don't know what the chain is actually. We actually think from other people's work and our own work that AVP neurons are important outputs for the clock, that VIP and GRP cells in the core might be the cells responding to the input and then helping organize uh, and set timing or communicate phase to these other neurons. So I, I don't think it's clear what the chain of events are either during photocontrainment or in the generation of circadian timing. And that's why I think this type of work where we can look at the whole circuit in vivo, not just at AVP neurons, is only the beginning of the story, right? I mean, there'll be a lot more we'll be able to do. Look at other cell types, broader ranges of cells narrow and see how they differ and, 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 and you know, how these populations, what role they might play in the generation of time. I think we just don't know. So, I mean, yeah. Hmm? They're, they're almost definitely there's there's dynamic signaling that's always kind of changing. Yeah, um, I, I and, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping on a little bit, but I, I mean, the way we interpret this, especially the stochasticity of rhythms are there and then they're not there and the same cell might be rhythmic and DD and, and, and not an LD, not all that different from what other people see in, in, in vivo imaging studies where you can actually ask these types of questions. Single cells don't have a single job that they keep all the time. There's actually dynamic sharing of function. And I think we're seeing the same thing in the circadian circuit that other people have characterized in like learning circuits and other things. So um, I don't know, hopefully I'm kind of answering your question. Yeah. Oh yeah, I never did. So these are polar plots. And basically what you have is a frequency histogram wrapped around 24 hours. So, and the length of the bar, um, so yeah, let me use a, an arrow here. Basically, if you have a long bar pointing in this direction, um, this means that one cell, two cells, three cells, and well, compare, this, these are now pairwise comparisons, not cells, but the concept is the same. That means they all shared this phase of peaking at what we can call circadian time or diurnal time or you know, zeitgeber time 10, which is kind of late in the day. It's before the lights turn out. It's before the animal becomes active. It's during the rest phase, late in the rest phase. That means a lot of these pairs are, are, are peaking at this time. So if you see a cluster of color in one area, that means they're all sharing a phase. That means they're all doing this, uh, they're showing this pairwise coherence maximal at a certain time of day and all the same as one another. Is that helpful? It's a it's a basically a population character. It's it's a way to plot phase of the whole population where each of the potential pairs is plotted separately, and then you see an aggregate around a certain time of day. That means that they these these. Uh, these rhythms are all sharing a phase. They're all maximal at the same time of day versus at all different times of day. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, the basics of, of the of kind of a walk through the process of the analysis. Um, okay. So the first thing we do is, and, and it's easier to think about in terms of the single cell data, just because it's it's just a simpler concept. Um, what's plotted here is just the, the, well, that's calcium wave number. If we looked at mean intensity, it's just how intense was the average signal for that time of day for that cell. And then we, we, we just did the cosigner analysis on every single one of those. Cosigner is just a way to, um, in an unbiased, you know, is there a strong uh, goodness of fit for a cosine curve? So that's, it's kind of a, with a, with p-value and everything. So it tells us um, whether there was a, circ circ a circadian rhythm, was there a, a, a difference across time of day that was, that looked circadian? Uh, and then, you know, whatever that p-value is ordered, ordered uh, is how we ordered these, uh, 
these heat maps. So, and that's why there, if there was a p-value of less than 0 0.05 for any given um, region of interest, it was plotted above, you know, it was plotted at the top and then the rest are just kind of randomly because they're not rhythmic. Now, the ones that are rhythmic, then we get phased from that same cosine analysis. It tells us what time did that cosine best fit? What was the peak of that cosine fit? And that's what's plotted in these circular plots. Right, and then again, the length of the bar is how many cells are at that phase, and if it's and if they're scattered all the way around the clock, that means there's no coherent phase. They're all peaking at different times of day, and if they're all if there if there's a cluster in one corner in one quadrant, that means they're sharing a phase, and then they're all kind of you know doing the same thing at the same time, which um, is more indicative of kind of population coordination. Right, and then to understand how that relates to the pairwise comparisons, it's just another kind of backflip you have to do mentally. But um, basically, we're asking the exact same questions about the coherence of each pair, like how similarly are they? Is do they have a rhythm and coherence? Basically, are they are they uh, doing something at the, you know at the same time? Um, and there's two time scales, so that's why it gets so confusing. We have the time scale that we're doing the correlation on, and then we're plotting those correlations at each time of day. Lovely, com like complicated concept. Um, but you know, is there a rhythm in the in the in the networking between two cells? Is, I guess is the simplest way to describe that. Uh, and and while there's still a small proportion of pairs that express a rhythm, they all express it. They all seem to do it at the same time, and there is a nice population rhythm that emerges. And you think think of that population rhythm as a signal to other parts of the brain that all. All these cells are all doing the same thing at the same time. There's some kind of coordinated signaling to happen, but only one time a day, and then kind of random noise at other times a day, right? Uh, so they share a phase, the nice tight phasing, uh, and and these rhythmic relationships. So if, if you think each of these re reflects a pair. Is there one cell that's pairing with all the other cells? So is there one mother oscillator cell? We had to ask that question. And the answer to that is, what are the number of rhythmic connections for any given neuron? And it's just a frequency histogram that shows that, the again, the modal number of connections for any given cell is between two and four, and very few of them have no relationships with any other pair, right? Three out of the you know four hundred or whatever the total the total uh, number of, of connections in DD uh, and and um, and 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 in LD as well you have a kind of a median number of connections of between two and six of rhythmic connections cells that have that pair are pairing up with other cells and in terms of this network coherence very few have zero. So most neurons are pairing with at least at least one other pair. Seems to be a general, if not universal. A fairly common observation. We still see state switching here. We have arrhythmic pairs that stay arrhythmic. We have rhythmic pairs that stay rhythmic, but we have all these that in the first day versus the second day of a 48 hour recording were rhythmic and then they stopped being rhythmic or started arrhythmic and become rhythmic. And that's true in LD uh, day one versus day two. And it's also true between DD and LD, there, there's some state switching. There's some pairs that are sto stochasticity here as well. It's if if a pair is always, it, there is no pair that's basically always correlated, but there's also no pairs that are never correlated, if that makes sense. All right. I'm trying to decide whether to tell you this next or the conclusions from AVP. First, I'm gonna hit the conclusions of AVP. Um, and then I'm gonna come back to kind of next steps. Um, I told you how hard this was. So this was long fought and long won. Um, AVP neurons in the SCN across the many variables that we measured, and I didn't even tell you about all of them, um, are stochastically rhythmic and population rhythms may be generated by an ever-changing subset of cells kind of sharing the load. And, and I've already hinted at this, but like, you know, in, in place cell research, you're not going to actually see, and this is in the literature, the same place cell responding to that location day after day after day after day. They actually do share the load. You'll see sometimes some of these papers show that uh, that it's this cell right here responds in that location. And the next day, it's a different cell. And then the third day, it goes back to the first cell again. Um, it seems like complexity and sharing the load is a feature of, of neural systems that you know, you're not going to appreciate unless you can look at, um, at, at large populations of cells in a region, in an intact behaving animal. Um, nearly all AVP neurons within the SCN have these interesting correlational relationships with partner cells, which kind of come and go across 
the day of night and peaks almost pretty consistently during the circadian day at, at the time of which people have thought the SCN was maximally active using other methods. Right, um, these pairwise relationships yet are still uh, stochastic. They're not always there. Um, and deep brain calcium imaging is challenging, but it's going to pay dividends for our understanding of cell uh, cell specific contributions to network timekeeping in the mammalian brain and also photic light responses, which is a whole other area of this research that we're still just uh, still just scratching the surface on. Now, I said how hard it was, but I wanted to talk about what we're doing now. Um, so Adam left the lab, I still have Morris, but now we've restaffed since COVID and people are, are, are finally getting up to speed and in, in, in implementing these techniques um, and, and getting, you know, getting things working again. Uh, but one of the strategies um, uh, we, we, we did was first of all, look at a broader cell type. Now we know what ADP cells look like, right? Nerve mean and S is another marker for SCN cells, but it's like 40% of the neurons and includes some ABP cells, some VIP cells, and then cells that don't express either of those neuropeptides, GRP as well. So you have all these other cells of kind of unknown phenotype. And, and this all kind of plays off the, uh, the notion uh, from a couple of single cell um, RNA-seq studies that have come out in the last few years showing there aren't three types of cells in the SCN. There's like 16 cell types, right? Um, according to, uh, you know, genomic signal and, 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 um, and, in their their um, their pattern of gene expression, uh, there seems to be a, a, a large number of cells. Um, so we thought we'd look broader, and, and you know, with again a focus on this diversity of function, and see if we can categorize different groups of cell types that that show different types of rhythms in vivo. Uh, so NMS is a broader cell type, uh, or a broader number of cells. Um, no longer using viruses. We now have AI one six two mice from Allen Brain Institute, and this is Floxed GCAMP six F. So uh, crossed with now a neuromine and S Cree, um, we have fluorescing cells before we do our implantation, which helps a ton, all right? Um, the specificity of NMS expression is beautiful. And this was already, we already knew this from the literature and Alan Brain Atlas and Seacher Ebrization studies um, uh, and, and um, you know, Sawa's lab who, uh, who, who did this work at UT Southwestern, but this is from our lab. This is now AM162 at NMS Cree. And so this is, and this is just fluorescence. This isn't uh, immunolabeled. This is actual G-CAMP um, in, in the slices. And you can see incredibly specific, incredibly high intense um, uh, fluorescence um, coming from this nucleus and only from this nucleus. So when you drop the lens in, if you're off target, you get nothing. You don't waste your time. You don't do a recording for months and then and then find out you're outside the SCN. It's a big plus. Um, the other plus is since it's lit up, as we drop the lens in, uh, oh, and this is just a close up, a higher mag. Um, uh, because we can do, uh, because it's fluorescing as we drop the lens in, we can now do targeted lens implantation. When we put the lens in, we actually start to see not necessarily cells, but definitely bulk fluorescence. And after several weeks, after, if we drop the lens in and we stop where we get maximum fluorescence, uh, then we let the animal recover and let all the inflammation go away. Then we see nice cellular signals. We're like three or four out of four now. It's like they're all working. We've gotten a female working for the first time. We, it just seems to be much easier now using this approach. We weren't sure it was going to work because the AA162, especially at a heterozygous, is only one copy of GCAMP. Unlike when you inject a virus, you can have hundreds, thousands of copies. So we were worried about the brightness of the signal, but it's not been a challenge at all. So highly specific, and it seems to be working well. Um, and just as a teaser, this was this was this week. Tons of cells. Um, you can see an especially enigmatic one right here. Uh, this is sped up twenty times, but it's the three minute recording. It was just recorded like Wednesday this week. Um, so we'll start to generate a lot more data in the very near future, and hopefully, all the tools we've developed will enable us to really speed up uh, the output. Uh, and these are two new people in the lab that I have to, I should have put a picture of them. Arena Jackson, Derek Camacho are kind of teaming up on this and doing a great job. Um, so let me just acknowledge Adam, who, uh, who really dove in on this um, and uh, did some great work. Uh, and Morris, um, here are the two that, that have now picked up the the project since. Um, Chris Allen's lab and Jimmy Chow um, contributed um, uh, uh, optogenetically targeted uh, 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 single unit recordings to validate the, the kind of burst firing of AVP neurons. 
Um, and Scopix has been hugely helpful, although we've had a, a, a basically a, a constant rotation of field service consultants. Every few months they change them, but we've, they've all helped us in various ways. Um, and I'm supported mostly by NIGMS and uh, the Keck Foundation really got us started with, uh, with this calcium imaging by buying us the Scopix cameras. So um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. So um, I will open the floor up to questions right now. I'm going to take the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, authority right now to ask the first one, um, this is Dr. Davidson. Um, uh, uh, Alec, great, great work. Now you've done a lot of, um, I don't want to say similar, but similar in vitro work um, before you started on this work here. You did a lot of, um, I would say, relatively kind of similar correlations between uh, neuronal firing. Um, what are you seeing? different in the in vivo model from what you saw in vitro. And if you are seeing something different, does that reflect potential um, uh, coupling, not only of SN neurons with each other, but of clock control processes outside of the brain? Yeah, okay. So um, what Katim is referring to is slice imaging of bioluminescence from uh, luciferase expressing mice, right? And there were, there's a number of differences between the techniques we're recording from potentially the same population of cells in some respects. So it's now we're measuring per expression, it's a circadian clock gene, and it could be in many different cell types. And we have in those experiments, most of them anyway, we didn't really have control of which cells we were recording from, whatever was in that slice, whatever is expressing per brightly with the luciferase signal is what ends up in that analysis. Um, you've sliced the SCN, so you've severed most of the connections. There's no more inputs, there's no more outputs, so it's a, it's a reduced prep. You've reduced coupling dramatically because of that. Uh, and uh, while they are acute uh, recordings, and they do reflect probably what the state of the network was prior, the actual kind of dynamics of remissity, I'm not sure, are all that faithfully reported in these slices. Um, the uh, it's it's also a much slower change. These are gene expression measures and not acute calcium. It's not EFIS. It's much much slower. Um, so seeing kind of dynamic coupling at the you know the second to second, there's no way to do that using bioluminescence. So I can't answer or ask some of those same questions. But as a general sense, we do see diversity of phase of gene expression patterns across the SCN, even in the slices. So. Um, now, do cells become rhythmic or stop being rhythmic? That are question, those are questions that never really were asked in these preps. We kind of just quantified everything. And, uh, and it's a, it, I think it's a much cleaner, less noisy measure, although it has all the caveats I just mentioned. So I think there's the, the results do not compete with one another at all. And I had to spend a lot of time speaking with the reviewers about this, um, that what we've seen in vivo is not at odds with anything the field has seen before. Um, it may feel different because you might have expected all these neurons to have robust rhythms, but they clearly don't. I don't find that distressing, but some people have. Um, but I don't think anything in the slice imaging really argues against that. Well, it seems to also validate so much of what you were doing. And you were doing the slices that people said was probably not uh, recapitulated in vivo. So that's, that's a nice yep. plus. Yep. Uh, 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 questions from the audience? Um, great talk, first of all. Um, I'm interested in how the activity of these neurons might change under conditions of like circadian disruption. So have you tried doing like either like like constant lighting or I mean any other number of like like high fat diet, any number of metabolic things that can disrupt that. Um, so yeah, I'm curious if you've done that or if not sort of what your plans or, or thoughts are. Yeah, no, you've hit on it exactly. And and so it's 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 funny, I said this to, to someone else earlier, if, as we develop new tools, we just keep repeating the same darn experiments because we're learning new things and more subtlety about how these networks are actually responding in these different challenging environments. Phase shifting in the animal and seeing how the clocks shift over, a uh, fairly you know, obvious thing to do that we haven't gotten to yet. Aging um, is another one that I put into the grant that you, know, you can potentially keep these animals alive and record them over a six month or 12 month span if you get lucky and see what the same neurons look like. You know, it's never 
heard of none before. And, and we might learn new interesting things about how the network is changing uh, in you know constant light where you reduce coupling. We ex I would I would have hypotheses maybe about how you know sync cell synchrony is going to go down. I mean we know in long days like twenty hours of light, then you get a phase differences that are that between the core and the shell that become quite profound. So you can kind of manipulate relative phase of different parts of the structure. So these are all kind of good questions and obvious questions. We had to start with the basics of what's rhythmic and is that a consistent feature. Um, and acute light responses are a super easy obvious one that also is very high priority which cells are responding the fastest and what are the what do those responses look like and how consistent across time are they and are they the same for a circadian phase advancing pulse light pulse versus a circadian phase delaying light pulse might different cells be involved in those things and we have some hypotheses from previous work but it is a new tool that enables us to see it in vivo uh, in a single cell and a network level and um, we we have all kinds of plans to do those things especially now that it's getting easier, that the technique is being improved and its success rates becomes more reasonable to actually target those things. Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Alec, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, continue to uh, keep in contact and mm -hmm. keep up with what you're doing. Thanks everyone for coming.